The Stone and the Flute by Hans Bemann was a humbling book to read. When I first read it back in high school, I wrote a review for it in the newsletter of our science fiction and fantasy club. The one thing I vividly remember stating in that review was that the mark of a great book is one that can make you laugh out loud and cry tears onto the pages. And since I was only in high school, I hadn't read many books with the power to do that. And the stone and the flute made me weep and laugh aloud on multiple occasions. I still believe that to chuckle and shed a tear is the barometer of a great story. There are good stories that don't touch your emotions in that way, but great stories? All great stories take you through that range of feelings. Any book that can make you feel such joy that you are laughing out loud and such sorrow that you actually sob is awe-inspiring. Not many novels have that kind of power in them to run through the full spectrum of human emotions. Now, author Hans Bemann was 60 years old when he wrote The Stone and the Flute, and it shows in his writing. I don't think a 20 or 30 or 40 year old author would be capable of writing something like this. When I read the book as a teenager, I was already on my way to being a writer, and what what I read in The Stone and the Flute was both humbling and inspiring. Humbling because I knew at my age I couldn't possibly write a book that came close to approaching this. And inspiring because it made me realize how much I had to learn and that maybe in 50 years I'd be able to create something that wondrous and magical. His achievement is even more amazing when you consider that he only wrote seven novels in his lifetime, and he had only written one novel before this. The Stone and the Flute was only his sophomore effort. Now, when we're children and teenagers, we often think, you know, we're totally awesome. Like, we can do anything. We can do things just as good as any adult we feel absolutely confident and sure of ourselves. Ah, well, <laughs> The Stone and the Flute was the first time in my life that my arrogance over writing was schooled and given a smackdown. The Stone and the Flute was the first time I read something where I truly realized I was incapable of creating something that good, and I wouldn't learn how to become that good in one year or five years or ten years. I realized this book was the culmination of a writer who had been honing his craft for decades and I had nothing on him. The main character of The Stone and the Flute is a young boy named Listener and the novel begins with his birth and ends with his death. Now, I apologize if you feel that revelation is a spoiler. I don't see it as one. Revealing that the book spans the entire lifetime of a character, to me, is a wonderful selling point. After all, this is the only story I have ever discovered in my entire life with the ambition to attempt such an audacious undertaking as spanning an entire lifetime. How many characters have you ever read about where you get to watch the whole of their lifetime? I've never seen any short story or novel try such a thing before. Thus, more so than any other book I know, you come to really feel for the character of Listener. By the time you reach the end of the book, you feel you have known Listener longer than anyone else you have ever met. He becomes your oldest friend. From his innocence of childhood, to his insolence of being a teenager, to his adventures as an adult, to his dignified journey into old age, you are by his side. You are a witness to all of his life. And the tone of the book is magnificent. 
it has the pace and demeanor of a Grimm's fairy tale. But <laughs> it's over 800 pages long. Now, I don't know if you ever sat down and actually read any of the Grimm's fairy tales, but to have a story of this length and magnitude maintain such a storybook resonance is utterly spellbinding. Here's the first few paragraphs. Once upon a time, a boy was born in Fragland, and this is his strange story. His father was a mighty man whom folk called the Great Roarer. He was tall and burly and liked to wear his shirt open on his hairy chest. His was a tempestuous nature. One moment he would fly into a terrible rage, and the next he would be shaking with loud laughter. Yet he was known for a just man, and so the people of Fragland had asked him to come from far away and be judge over them in that part of the country. Now when the great roarer came to Fragland to take up his duties, he brought his wife with him, a quiet woman who kept so much out of the public eye that at first many thought she was not wedded to him. She was said to be the daughter of the gentle fluter, of whose arts they had heard in Fragland, although he lived very far away, beyond the great forests of Barlabog. Folk said his fluting was so sweet that even the birds would fall still to hear him, and so soothing to the spirit that many a man's quarrel had been settled by the notes of his flute alone. Such a spellbinding beginning, and the book maintains that storybook atmosphere for all 855 pages, beginning to end. Listener is unlike any fictional character I have seen because he is portrayed so realistically. He isn't always heroic. He is occasionally downright villainous. Yet deep inside, he means well and does come to repent for his wrongs. In other words, he's a lot like you. That is ultimately what is so profound about this story. The journey is a metaphor into your own life. And no matter what your age when you read this book, you will, at some point, experience the story at the same age as listener. And because of that, he becomes relatable to everyone. We easily see our own past and present and future in his life. And it makes us all the more cognizant of how important our past and future decisions shall prove to become. As an American, I'm not sure what the world of books and literature is like in other English-speaking countries like England and Australia. However, I presume that most of us are exposed to similar books. Maybe I'm wrong, but I tend to imagine that best-selling authors in America and England are, for the most part, the same batches of people. I know in America we don't often have the chance to read great books and novels from other cultures. The Stone and the Flute by Hans Bemann was originally written in German and translated into English by Anthea Bell. Other than the never-ending story, it may be, in fact, I'm almost certain it is, the only book I've ever read that was not authored by someone who natively speaks English. And not only was this a wonderful story, but it also made me realize what a shame it is that people all over the world miss out on storytelling which never gets translated into our native tongues. How many great stories are out there in French and German and Japanese and Russian and Spanish that I will never get to read in my lifetime? Authors 
we will never hear about, books we will never know existed. One of the great things about language is the ability to articulate the commonality of the human condition. The most memorable sentences we ever read tend to be the ones which eloquently express those intimate life experiences that we think no one else ever goes through. We come across a sentence in a book and we say, oh my gosh, this person thinks that every time they step into the shower? I do that too. That is the commonality of the human condition. That's one of the most inspiring and uplifting things to encounter in writing. That serendipity of realizing we relate to each other as people in ways we never expected. And to think, all those books from all those cultures, written in languages that will never be translated, how much are we missing? How many beautiful stories will we never have the chance to share? But, thanks to Anthea Bell, The Stone and the Flute by Hans Biman is not one of those stories. This glorious German masterpiece is a story that the entire English-speaking world can enjoy. That is reason enough to read this story. Read a copy of The Stone and the Flute and expose yourself to a viewpoint from another culture and see the beauty of a lifetime through the eyes of another world. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, keep speaking English, America. Which is kind of an ironic thing to put at the end of a video where I'm talking about other languages. But do it. American English.